It's time we were both free. This scene right here, besides being cool as heck, is such a monumental and important scene, not just in this game, but in the Metal Gear franchise as a whole. And the best thing is that it all took place in purely subtext, visuals, gameplay, and even by you and your expectations. But to understand the importance of this scene, we must first turn back the clock. Not just till the beginning of the game, but even till before the game was even released. This is show and tell, and why Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty is a marvel in visual storytelling. And be aware, there'll be heavy spoilers ahead. The year is 2000. It's been two years since Metal Gear Solid came out and changed video games forever in terms of storytelling and directing. People were wondering, what was Kojima up to and would we ever see the hero Snake we had come to love again? Then, one day, all our silent wishes came true. At E3 2000, Konami revealed Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty in a damn near 10 minute long trailer. Not only did the trailer present us with a leap of graphics we had never seen before, an attention to details that made other games blush, but also an orchestral theme by none other than Harry Gregson Williams, a professional music composer of movies such as The Rock. But we also got to see one important element. The legendary Solid Snake. The trailer presented us with Snake maneuvering around on a ship, doing what he does best. Sneaking, crawling, leaning up against walls, shooting enemies, as well as all new stuff such as leaning around corners, hanging from railings, hiding bodies, and more. People were hyped beyond compare, and the hype reached a fever pitch when a demo for the game was bundled with Kojima's action game, Zone of the Enders, in March 2001. Here we got to play some of the segments we had seen in the trailers of Snake maneuvering around on the ship and got to experience all the new elements, the new gameplay features and the new story. Later that year, another trailer landed. This one sported a lot more footage from the ship, more music by Harry Gregson Williams and also told us things such as Solid Snake being dead and being the leader of a terrorist group called Sons of Liberty. We even got to see things that were never actually in the base game, of Snake fighting Fortune, the immortal goddess of death, confronting the cyborg ninja, and fighting Vamp. Anyone who has played the game knows these are not true things. These things does in fact not happen in the game. Another thing should be apparent to these same people too. Thus far, we haven't seen anything of the main protagonist of Metal Gear Solid 2, Raiden. All the trailers prior to the game's launch, all the marketing, even the American and European game cover and the preview pictures on the back, all had Solid Snake front and center. We were ready to play Solid Snake, and that's because Hideo Kojima played us like a damn fiddle. They played us like a damn fiddle! The first two or so hours of Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty started with, as promised, Snake on the ship, but it very quickly became obvious that what we had expected, which was superpowered bosses, the super spy who always won, even the idea of having to acquire weapons on site, all of that were not here. In fact, it was almost like the game teased the player for having those expectations. Instead of having to acquire weapons on site, he got one of the strongest weapons in the game right off the bat, a weapon that could incapacitate enemies with no consequences if they should be found, equipped with a silencer and even lots of ammo. The one weapon you would acquire was from the tanker's one and only boss, Olga, a pregnant female soldier. There was nothing supernatural about her, just a pregnant woman with a gun. These reversals changed Metal Gear Solid 2's formal player-actor relationship. Other Metal Gear games had made their actors rely upon the player for arms, yet the Tenga chapter only gave the character weapons in-game through Snake's narrative foresight and resourcefulness. 
The player controls Snake less as an actor and Snake's decisions as a character determine the range of the player's actions. This whole disconnect between the player and the character will become important later on. Even the whole idea of infiltration that the player had grown accustomed to from playing Metal Gear Solid 1 was scorned. As where before you had infiltrated Shadow Moses and stopped the enemy's plans, here you had been lured to the tanker and whereas before Snake had been treated as a hero for his mission, here he was painted as a villain and failed his mission. And as the tanker with Snake on board sank, with Ocelot in an improved Metal Gear in companionship with the President and with incriminating evidence of Snake, we as audience were left wondering, what the heck was going on? We even got Otacon screaming out Snake, a thing that's become a meme now, but has otherwise been cemented into the player's brain as a sound linked to having failed your mission. Now, it's not like we've never seen Snake fail before, but in Metal Gear Solid 1 it all evened out to a certain extent. Snake's mere presence would kill two civilians, or rather one civilian and one Foxhound member, simply by being near them, but would at the same time save Meryl and Otacon. Snake would accomplish nothing from breaking Rex's radar and lose his old friend Grey Fox as a result, but would in turn as a result of this, get the tools to beat Rex. Heck, if you failed the torture scene and got Meryl killed, the game was made in such a way that you could play the game over with the stealth camouflage to trivialize your path up to the torture scene, just so you could give it another go. And in the end, Snake saves the day, the world, and gets a friend and the lady and finds out he is free to do whatever he wants. Quite a leap from that to what happened to him during the Tanga mission, huh? Now that we have the setup, it's time to get into the meat and potatoes of the actual game. The game opens up with a soldier infiltrating an oil plant by swimming through the water in scuba gear. This serves several functions, but for visual storytelling I'm gonna focus on two. We just saw Snake submerge in water, and here this guy is alive in water. It's to make the person believe, aha, Snake survived and is now on to his next task. And it also served as a callback to how Snake infiltrated Shadow Moses in the first game. Trust me, there will be a lot of this. When emerging into the plant, the player gets the first real look of our hero who has the codename Snake and a Foxhound stealth suit. All the pieces are there. This is Snake, this is our hero. This is all exactly as it was at the beginning of the first game, almost shot for shot. But then... It's not. The moment you leave the first area, you start realizing subtle yet drastic changes. For one being the color palette. The first game had dominant blue and grey colors to go with the color aesthetic, and here everything is orange and yellow, almost the complete opposite. Heck, if you die as Snake on the Tanga, it plays a recognizable jingle from the first game and gives us the memorable mission fail screen. But if we die as Raiden, it plays a completely different tune and shows us a completely different screen. Snake, what's wrong? Snake? Right, what's wrong? Right, right. Also, when you enter the elevator room, you immediately see someone moving up the elevator, seen from the back, just as it had been done with Liquid from Metal Gear 1. And you don't even have to worry about the guards. Whoever was there already took care of them. Someone has already infiltrated the place faster and better than you. This is almost comedically juxtaposed to how it was in the first game where the first segment can be difficult even to this day to move through because of the guards patrolling the area. Returning to the game, 
You then walk over and punch in your information on a computer. Whoever he is, he's got some skills. We need to get an ID. But for now, you can take advantage of the situation and get to work. There's a terminal in front of the elevator, a node. Did you say nerd? Not nerd, node. The computer gives you all the tools and thus incentivizes you to fill in your details. Your name, your birthday, all that stuff. This too becomes incredibly important later on, and trust me, Raiden calling the node a nerd is not coincidental at all. The terrorists call themselves Sons of Liberty. Sons of Liberty? The name of their leader is Solid Snake. After traveling up the elevator, discarding your diving gear just like Snake in MGS1, we finally get the first real look at our soldier after having his codename changed from Snake to Raiden. Let's pause here and compare the two. If you look at Snake, we see a big muscular masculine guy. I mean, of course he is. His body was apparently supposed to be like Jean-Claude Van Damme of all people. The guy looks rugged. He smokes. He's a bad boy. Now, let's look at Raiden. Long girly hair, feminine delicate face, slender limbs, he doesn't smoke. Heck, I even think there's some heels in his boots. Safe to say these two are polar opposite of one another. This too becomes apparent when you start playing Raiden. When Snake would do a realistic and practical tactical role, Raiden will do this. Moving on, this is also where we finally meet Raiden's crew. Just like in the earlier game, you have a frequency on your codec to call Colonel Campbell and a frequency to save your progress at a female soldier, which in this case has been changed from Mei Ling to Rose, who is not a soldier. And according to the files, she knows you better than anybody else. Rose may be in the service, but an intelligence analyst is no field officer. Not to worry, she has our technical staff at her disposal. She's never been a part of a field mission. This is insane. I have my own reasons for selecting her for this mission, soldier. Colonel, I fail to see. I know your VR training performance in and out, but sometimes that's not enough. You're familiar with the Shadow Moses incident? You know I covered it in VR. If there's a crucial tactical detail that case taught us, it was the power of the operative's will to survive. I was trained to fight. My personal feelings have no place in a mission. We've learned that it doesn't work that way. And on the field, you need all the help you can get. Jack, you're stuck with me whether you like it or not. Rose. Also, I'd remiss to neglect to say this. Ryan's real name is Jack and Rose's name is Rose because it's a reference to Jack and Rose from the Titanic. Oddly fitting, considering they too are linked to a sinking ship. Another reference to Raiden's real name is Jack is that of playing cards. Fortune has the title Queen, Solidus has the title King, and Raiden is Jack. I even think that Ocelot at one point is called Joker. But anyway, that's beside the point. It should also be stated that if you played the Tanga mission before this one, which most people will, Raiden will actively comment on having done that mission over 300 times doing VR. This is important and we'll get back to it later. Well, the tanker part felt like a perfect sequel to the first game with its open structure, its huge showcase of all the new elements, the same color scheme, Snake back in glorious new graphics, less codec calls, more action, less cutscenes, the beginning of the plant is everything, but... You're constantly being stopped for a new codec call, a new cutscene that often really didn't need to be there, and there's not that many new elements to play around with as there was on the Tango. Let's put a pin in this one too for now. The mission this time is familiar to us. Political officials kidnapped, hostages are being held, and the terrorist group wants stuff linked to a nuclear weapon. As you progress, you stumble into a confrontation between the SEAL team and Fortune, where the SEAL team are getting slaughtered left and right. This stands out because this is something you are not familiar with from the first game, where Snake was the only one at Shadow Moses Island. Already you've been incentivized to look for differences from the first game, because you, the player, has no knowledge about a scenario like this, Raiden 2 doesn't know how to act, 
And as of such, just stands and watches as Fortune kills the SEAL team, and you're left to move through the mess she left due to your inaction. What the hell is that? Come, put me out of my misery. Today is another bad day. Is there anyone here that can give me happiness? But this is only the advertiser. Later you come into a hallway littered with corpses and your brain immediately goes to the hallway into the Grey Fox fight. Once again, let's pause here for a second. When playing Metal Gear Solid 1, upon infiltrating Shadow Moses, you overhear some guards talking about someone besides you having infiltrated the base. Someone who uses stealth and who is not supposed to be there. Something happened? There's an intruder. Really? He's already done three people. He's killed three people? Yeah. Say so he's using stealth, too. Stealth? There's an intruder besides me? The person they're referring to here is Grey Fox. When you meet Grey Fox in Metal Gear Solid 1, you have to fight him, and after fighting this fearful warrior in hand-to-hand -hand combat, when he has been seen taking down several armed guards, Grey Fox compliments Snake and acknowledges him as a warrior before having to leave. Let's return to Metal Gear Solid 2 and see how Raiden does in this scenario. What are you? Five today. Or rather six. Not only does he not save anyone, but he hardly even gets to fight the killer who in this case is Vamp. In fact, was it not for someone interfering, Raiden would be dead. Raiden trying to mimic Snake's actions almost dies as a result and has to be saved by Pliskin here, who obviously is Snake. It's first when Snake comes in and saves the day that Vamp makes his retreat. This is where we get some insight in Raiden, who explains he's been trained to be like Solid Snake through VR missions, where he acted as Snake during Shadow Moses and the Tanker. It's not accidental that they show Metal Gear Solid VR gameplay as he's talking about this, and that Raiden has to explain that it's basically a video game, but indiscernible from the real thing. Dance VR, huh? But realistic in every way. A virtual grunt of the digital age, that's just great. That's far more effective than live exercises. You don't get injured in VR, do you? Every year a few soldiers die in field exercises. There's pain sensation in VR and even a sense of reality and urgency. The only difference is it isn't actually happening. That's the way they want you to think, to remove you from the fear that goes with battle situations. War is a video game. What better way to raise the ultimate soldier? Raiden is us, in more ways than you might think. We put our name in on the note. We didn't have Raiden's full name or birthday, so we put in our own. We came into this expecting to be Snake, just like Raiden did. And now we're stuck being this Raiden character, which even Raiden isn't too happy with. He, like us, wants to be Snake. But there's a problem. Snake is no longer us. 
Snake is his own character now, his own person. Just like he took some of the actions out of our hands by coming prepared to the tanker, now he is completely out of our grasp and is moving around completely independent doing stuff on his own, better than we can. This entire element is key for the narrative that is being played and will hardly even be mentioned in any of the game's many many dialogues. What you need to remember for now is that Raiden is trying to be Snake, and everything you see that is similar to Metal Gear Solid 1 is on purpose. Not just for the program that's being revealed later, but for the underlying narrative. From here we can skip a little, cause a lot of this is just nailing this theme into our brain again and again. Raiden meets Saldus, and after taking the fight against his jet in a fight similar to the helicopter fight in Metal Gear Solid 1, you find out that the Metal Gear is already active, your way forward is hindered, and you don't even win. Saldus taunts you and then leaves. That's Metal Gear! It's already active! You fight Fat Man who has planted bombs all across the plant and if you at any point call Snake, you will hear him mentioning him taking care of bombs on his end too. These bombs will typically be in near impossible positions while yours are rather simple. Unless you play on European Extreme of course where a bomb will be attached to a guard's back for one. After your actual fight with Fat Man you again see some dissonance in the familiarity. The fight is very reminiscent of the fight against Vulcan Raven from Metal Gear Solid 1 where you are maneuvering around big containers trying to hit a big guy. But where Vulcan Raven would both before, during and after acknowledge Snake as a warrior or great fighter, Fat Man just laughs at you and mocks you. Answer me, what the hell is this? It's the switch for the biggest bomb in the entire place. No use. Once it's activated, there's no stopping the count. Where did you plant it? Where is it? Somewhere in this area. Don't worry, it's very close by. Where is it? Go ahead, shoot me. I'm already dead. Damn! Think you can find it? When it goes off, it'll take the big shell with it. Tell me where I can find the bomb! That's your problem. He doesn't even tell you where the last bomb is. You have to actively move his corpse in a rather unromanticized way to get the bomb. Your fight against fortune is not much greater. Where before you would have a fight such as the fight against Sniper Wolf or Grey Fox where you couldn't hit them with your weapon but would still find a way to turn things around. The only way to win here is to wait like a coward behind cover till Wham comes and stop Fortune. That's not him. It is here, where Raiden shoots someone mid-conversation, that he actually manages to shoot them. But even then, he doesn't die. Still, Raiden was able to hurt a boss simply cause he did something Snake never did in Metal Gear Solid 1, which was act out of turn. As you progress through the game, unless you are not paying attention, it becomes evident that the game is punishing Raiden and you for playing as Snake. The game actively taunts you for doing this. Every time you try to do what Snake did before, you come up short. Fight the jet with a stinger missile, Metal Gear is revealed and activated. Your path is blocked and your enemies survive. Fight Fortune, you waste ammo. Kill Fat Man, you don't find where the last bomb is. Nowhere does this become more apparent however than when you fight them the second time. The first time you fight them it's unlike any other fight you've ever experienced, therefore you're able to somewhat defeat them. But because you're still playing the game like Metal Gear Solid 1, you and Raiden fail. Later on when escorting Emmerich over the water and you're left to take a sniper position just like Snake's fight against Sniper Wolf, where you have to take careful aim, look for any and all movements and feed yourself diazepam. Vamp appears again, almost as if punishing Raiden and you for going back to Metal Gear Solid 1, back to wanting to be Snake, he stabs Emma, leaving her to die. 
and even then you don't actually kill them. After this and the virus is uploaded to the enemy's computer, Snake and the cyborg ninja who thus far have spouted nothing but the same lines as Grey Fox betrays Raiden and knocks him out. This is where the game and the narrative really change. Hold it, Snake. Time to change the disc. I know, I know, it's a pain. But you need to swap disc one for disc two. You see the disc labeled two? Nah. Uh, no. Huh? Oh, wait. We're on PlayStation 3. It's a Blu-ray disc. Dual layered, too. No need to swap. Damn it, Otacon. Get a grip. This is where everyone who played the game had to exhale and go, Okay. What is even going on here? And for us who analyze the game, it's no different. What is the deal with punishing us for wanting to be Snake? Why are we playing this girly soldier who sucks at everything, who hasn't accomplished anything, and who has to be saved by Snake all the time? Well, don't worry, cause weirdly enough, the upcoming part that confused the most people is actually where we will find meaning. Is he still, is he alive? still alive? alive? He was he when Olga brought him in. in. I've checked I've everything, checked including the genome, genome data, data, but there's nothing there's on this guy. guy. NSA, NSA, CIA, CIA FBI. FBI. He doesn't exist in any database. He's a non-existent operative from a non-existent organization. I suspected as much. However, I know this man. Hmm? Wake him up. He doesn't exist. Now, I purposely neglected to show our codec conversation going on between Raiden and Rose. Jack. What is it? I've always been alone. Huh? I'm so lonely. Lonely? Rose, we've always... Not always. What do you mean? You've never slept beside me. What are you talking about? I... After we've been together in my room, you stay awake all night. Or you head for the door. Is this really the time to bring this up? Why, Jack? Why? Listen, Rose. I'm right in the middle of a mission, and I... Why? Why can't you relax when you're with me? Look, the mission... I... Why don't you open up to me? Rose, I, I just can't. All I ever wanted was to share your dreams. To spend a meaningful evening with you. I just wanted to find you by my side when I woke up. Is that asking too much? It's the night. I'm scared of the night. It's got nothing to do with you. Scared of the night? What's that supposed to mean? I can't relax when I'm with someone. Jack, you wouldn't even let me in your room. I need privacy. I just can't be bothered. Bothered? Wrong word. What I wanted to say was that there are certain things that I have to keep to myself. Do you remember that time I forced my way into your room? We'd known each other for almost a year, and you blew up. It was the first time you ever raised your hand against me. I was so worried about you. Look, I'm sorry. It wasn't your violent nature that scared me. It was your room, your heart. Stop it. There wasn't anything in your room. Only a bed and a small desk. It looked like a prison cell. <laughs> Rose? No television set. No family pictures. Not even a poster. Rose, I only use that room for sleeping. A lifeless room. Almost like your empty heart. That's why I tried to keep you out. I thought I was beginning to understand you. Until I saw that room. Would you have been happier if I had a picture of you hanging on the wall? That's not what I was trying to say. Enough, Rose. We'll talk about this later. After the mission. Right. After the mission. I understand. Pay attention to what Rose says here. And also pay attention to Raiden's response. All he wants is to get back to the mission. Mission this, mission that. Raiden has no personality other than the mission. When we hear about his room, there's a bed and a desk and that's it. No posters, paintings, pictures, nothing. 
Raiden is an empty shell. He's not a defined character. He doesn't exist. He tried to be Snake and that has been taken away from him. Now would probably be a good time to talk about what one of the things that Metal Gear Solid 2 is trying to tell through its visual storytelling and its underlying messages. It's all about creating one's own identity. Raiden has just gone through an entire ordeal where every time he tried to be someone else, where he tried to be Snake, his ideal soldier, his role model, he failed. Now that it's cost him the life of a young innocent girl, Emma, it really hits home for him. Why else do you think you had to escort her and have so many conversations with her in that short of a time frame about nothing? It was to show Raiden bonding with her. This impacts him harder than the faceless soldiers or even the president. And now he's here, hanging on the torture apparatus, naked as the day he was born, exposed literally for everyone to see. His stealth suit is gone and so are all his guns. Now he can't even cosplay a snake anymore. What then follows is Solidus explaining how he knows Raiden and for the first time we actually get some background information about him. The 80s. A civil war. You were one of the best among the child soldiers that fought in that conflict. When you were barely 10 years old, you became the platoon leader of the small boy unit. At the time, your outstanding kill record earned you several nicknames, including White Devil and Jack the Ripper. Jack, I was your godfather. I named you. When the war ended, you disappeared from the relief center. I wondered what happened to you. I should have known they would recruit you. We hear about him being a child soldier, how he earned the title Jack the Ripper and more. We have Raiden talk with Rose and we learn more about Raiden than we ever have up to this point. There was never a real reason for me to fight, except that someone put a gun in my hand. And that someone was him. It wasn't your fault. If I survived the day's fight, I was praised, fed, and had a bed to sleep in. I think I was only six when I held my first AK. But I'm not even sure of that. Jack. I'm not like Snake. I never questioned why we fought. There was no purpose, no way out. They give you a gun, you ask how many to kill. If you didn't, you were the one they shot instead. It's okay. No one is blaming you. We were shown Hollywood action films every day. The kind with macho guys and big guns. They call it image training. Ugh. They... They built us from the ground up into killing machines. We were fed once a day. I can still taste the gunpowder they mixed into the food. Gunpowder? In the food? The gunpowder had toluene in it, giving it hallucinogenic properties. It kept us drugged, controllable. Oh my god! <laughs> when the Civil War ended, those of us who survived were taken in by NGOs. They gave me a new life in the States. I can't complain. But nothing's changed. The only people who have no problem with my past have secrets and agendas of their own. Terrible nightmares. Every night. I can never forget. Jack. I'm afraid of the night. That's why I don't sleep next to you. You should have told me. Told you what? That I'm a killer? And always have been? No. No. What I hate more than anything else in the world is my own past. I didn't want you or anyone to know about it. <laughs> now I know why I was chosen for this mission. No one can take him on, take him down, except me. I've been kept alive this long for this. I knew as soon as I saw Solidus. Jack, I love you the way you are now. You have to believe me. <sighs> I didn't know anything about you, I admit that. Where you were born, how you grew up. But I know that now. And I know that what I feel for you can only get better. 
and I'll share in your past if that's the price. It doesn't work that way. No one can share the burden of what I've done. It's not one of those warm and fuzzy things couples share. I accept the good and the bad, Jack. That's what you do for someone you love. I don't want to share my past with anyone. I just want to forget about it. Jack, I haven't told you, you know, about what I've done. <sighs> the last two years with you, it's been more than I've ever hoped for. Jack. But I can't go any farther. I know you want to get married. I... But I can't. I can't risk starting a family. There's no way to erase my childhood. <laughs> it's all right, Jack. Please, don't say any more. Up till now, Raiden was just our vehicle. Raiden was us. Therefore, we didn't need any information about Raiden. We thought, oh, he's just another snake. And that would do. But now Raiden is shaping up to be his own character. Raiden being naked also serves the function of having him being reborn. There's a reason why when you move through Arsenal gear, its rooms are named after internal organs. Raiden is figuratively being birthed within Arsenal gear. It's also to ridicule him. Almost as if going, haha, you thought you were Snake. It should also be stated that Raiden is now fighting against us in terms of gameplay. He cannot grab opponents or use guns because he insists on covering himself up. He, the character, does not wish to be exposed and that affects our gameplay. A disconnect between the player using Raiden as an avatar and Raiden being his own character is starting to occur. As we move through Arsenal gear, we start getting weird calls from Campbell and Rose. The game will even tell us the game has failed. Raiden, turn the game console off right now. What did you say? The mission is a failure. Cut the power right now. Our radar will show us creepy girl videos and more. Heck, I even think Campbell at one point calls you and just lists up train stations in Osaka. Now, us who played the game knows this is because the virus Emma uploaded is breaking down GW. And as of such, the AI is breaking down. But it is also because Raiden's illusion of being Snake is breaking down. The world he's in doesn't make sense to him anymore, just like he doesn't make sense to us, the player. Through the gameplay, we are entering new territory we don't understand. Everything has changed, both the environment and the enemies, and even our character's behavior. There's nothing like this in Metal Gear Solid 1. It's almost like we're playing the game for real for the first time. Raiden eventually meets up with Snake where he gets all his gear back. But there's one key difference. Raiden also gets a sword. Why? Olga asked me to give it to you. Besides, I'm not a big fan of blades. When asked if Snake doesn't want to use it, Snake replies that swords aren't his thing. This is both because Snake doesn't have the best track record with swords, but also because he knows that is not him, that is not his personality. Raiden then takes a sword and we get to experience Raiden as never before. Up till now, the way Raiden has controlled has been very similar to the way Snake controlled in Metal Gear Solid 1 and also the Tanga. In fact, the only difference was how Raiden would do this instead of the tactical roll when we press the crouch button. But now, where he gets the sword, the controls are completely different. Where before you would push buttons, now you have to flick the right analog stick and even push it down for a unique attack. Even the control scheme is telling us now that Raiden is different from Snake. What then follows is Raiden and Snake mowing down a bunch of ninja guards. Actually, the rest of the game from here on out is no longer stealth based. 
I don't even think you can stealth it. If you at any point try and revert back to using pistols and rifles, you're gonna make the mission a lot harder for yourself as the ninjas will evade your shots by jumping around and sometimes deflect your bullets. Once you clear this hallway, you enter a room. Just look at how Raiden and Snake are positioned. Where before Snake had to protect Raiden, Snake now trusts Raiden to have his back and they are shown to be on equal footing with both their size and how much they take up every frame. They are even now because Raiden no longer tries to mimic Snake. However, Snake sends Raiden up a ladder to fight against the Metal Gear Rays. Here we are forced to use our rocket launcher, which is obviously because Raiden hasn't grown 100% into his own person yet, and this is how you fought the Metal Gear Rex in Metal Gear Solid 1, and he's still trying to be Snake. This is despite we see you can actually take out Metal Gear Rays in close quarter combat just fine. In fact, the entire fight will be prematurely ended with Raiden taking a knee, giving up. He is his own character, but he is still dependent on Snake, taking control away from you in the process and failing because of it. As punishment for this, Olga gets killed and Snake and Raiden are captured. You have to. Olga! Then a bunch of stuff happens and eventually Arsenal Gear crashes into New York. Fun fact, we were originally gonna see Arsenal Gear hit the coast of New York and leave a lot of destruction in its wake, but yeah, stuff happened in 2001 that left that cut out. Due to the collision, Soldas, Raiden's father and Raiden gets thrown off of Arsenal Gear and lands on the roof of Federal Hall. Here, Raiden gets taunted by the AI of Campbell and Rose and Solidus gloats that he was the one who killed Raiden's dad and mom. By the way, Jack, I was the one who killed your parents. He also says that while the two are similar, they are also different. Now, Solidus represents the wish to be like Snake, the closest thing to Big Boss. Just like Raiden had longed to become Snake, so does Solidus wish to become Big Boss. And then the scene happens. It's time we were both free. We have finally reached this scene, where Raiden is freed from his shackles figuratively and literally by his sword. The thing that made him the child soldier Solidus explained he was. A warrior who favored the blade. And just like that, Raiden for the first time in the game actually wins a satisfying win against the boss, fighting them fair and square with no one interfering or besting them. All when he left behind Snake, grew to become his own character and beat Solidus with a sword. <laughs>
By the way, what is that? Dog tags. Anyone you know? No, never heard the name before. I'll pick my own name, and my own life. I'll find something worth passing on. At the end, Snake questions Raiden's dog tag that he was wearing. We also saw it on Raiden when he was naked in the torture chamber, where we first started to see his character come into light. When Raiden takes it off, he doesn't recognize the name. Snake even asks if he knows the person, to which Raiden answers no. The name on that dog tag is ours, the one we punched into the node at the beginning. Raiden then throws away the dog tag, the nerd. Did you say nerd? The one who wanted to be Snake. Raiden doesn't need us anymore. He actively discards us who wanted to be like Snake. We wanted that because of the marketing we had seen prior to the game being released, because this was a sequel to Metal Gear Solid 1, because we loved Snake so much. Infinite ammo. We were primed and ready to be Snake, just like Raiden was. And by the way, Snake, we're changing your code name for all following communication. What's wrong with Snake? Just a precaution. You are now designated Raiden. But Raiden grew to understand that nothing good would come from being someone else. It was first when he acted like he wanted to, like he was supposed to, like himself, that he started accomplishing something. The game as of such tells us a lot of stuff about being true to oneself, no matter how little you may think of that self. And it never, even once, mentioned it. This is all told through the way the game plays, what it shows us, how it shows us it, and adding ambiguity to words we normally wouldn't suspect. Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty is a marvel in terms of visual storytelling, and I hope, if nothing else, that this has whetted your palette for more videos of this sort, because now you can see just how much you can tell without saying a word of it. Snake? What's wrong? Nothing. Can I ask you something? Who am I, really? I wouldn't know. But we're going to find out together, aren't we? Oh. Yeah. See me for what I am, okay? I know. I stare at the stars and the sky up above and think what am I made of? Am I full of sorrow? Am I hurt and pain? Or am I filled with love? I walk by myself on the streets below.